So I'm uh, Amanda Tuminello. Um, I'm with the HPC Modernization Program. Um, our program is a tri-service program made up of the Air Force, Army, and Navy. We have uh, five distinct uh, data resource centers. Uh, we also have uh, the state-of-the-art defense research and engineering network called DREN. And um, on the right here is what we do. We do science and technology, test of evaluation, and acquis acquisition and engineering. Um, we do a lot of really cool science on our systems, and we touch all areas. So we do uh, ocean models. We do um, acquisition and engineering on new air, uh, airplanes and helicopters. Whoops. <clears throat> So our data centers are distributed uh, for our CONUS, and we have one in Maui. So we are, we are staffed by 350 uh, people. We have over 2,000 users from three DOD services and additional agencies. We have over 995,000 cores available with 45.6 petaflops aggregate and over 7 billion compute hours we are able to provide our users annually. We also have 120 petabytes of data stored, <clears throat> and all of that is connected with a 40, gig 40 gigabyte um, network. So this is just going over our centers again. So this is uh, what our current data environment looks at each of our DSRCs. We have multiple um, HPC systems, which have, each of those systems have a dedicated parallel file system attached to it. Um, sometimes it has more than one file system. We have, each data center has what we call a center-wide file system, which is currently a GPFS file system that all the HPC systems connect to, and we can move our data over there to that central file system. And then it, every DSRC has an HSM where we can do long-term ar archival to tape. Most of our applications currently require data access via the POSIX interface. So as far as data workflows, we have two different types of workflows. We have our research and we have time sensitive. With our research, users can run their application on any of our HP systems that they have allocation. And by allocation, I mean every user, whenever they are getting, they have time allocated to them, they have hours associated, and they are distributed across the, uh, the DSRC systems to work at. So if they use all of their allocation on one system, they take their data with them, they move it to the next one, and they use their hours there. Once they're done with their computing, they can either copy the data to a remote site that they want to, they can put it on the center-wide file system, or they can copy it to our HSM. With time-sensitive workflows, it is somewhat similar to our normal research, but it, it, IO variability hampers their processing. They have distinct differences, like they, they just run the gamut of I.O. So anything good or bad, they throw at it. But what they really, really want is ensured performance every time they land on a system. That way that they know whenever they start at this time, their delivery is gonna happen three hours later, or whatever the time frame may be. So what are our, what are our current limitations? We have duplication of data across sites. We have problems staging our data to the work site. So if I want to work somewhere and my data is not there, I have to copy it, wait for it, and then I can do my work. Migrating our old data from old technology to new technology is time consuming. Quotas, everywhere you go, you have a different set of quotas. So you're not really sure how much you have at any given site. So you're always having to check that. Ability to query data holdings based on user group and data types. So what all data is out there? <clears throat> we don't really know. If a user leaves the program, we don't know, you know, that data becomes orphaned, and it's kind of hard to bring it back to, you know, what was it and what is it good for now. And then the inability to prof profile user I.O. behavior in real time. So we can't really see what a user's doing on the I.O. subsystem at any time. So this is where if I had three wishes, it's more like 30, for metadata, and how can we make it more rich to meet our requirements? So a user for meta metadata, ability to find the physical location of all copies of data. I call this as the where's my keys, you know, for all users. 
So if you're working on a system and then you get off and go and say, you know, leave the project for a little while and come back a couple of months later, I always have to go back and search for where was I and what was I doing. How many files do I own in the capacity? You know, I want to know across the program. I don't want to know just on a single system. I want to know all of my data holdings. I want to know the I.O. characteristics of where my data is. So what's my throughput on this system? What's my throughput and capabilities on another system? Um, chain of custody. Who's looking at my data? What digital access, it, you know, what all is trying to access my data? Because, you know, on some sensitive things that you might be working on, it does matter if someone from another place is trying to access your data and look at it. Um, extended attributes that are easily searchable and the ability to enhance those attributes over time. So uh, for the Navy, you know, specifically, we chart the bottom of the ocean floor, we do acoustic data, we do sea surface, we get data coming in from satellites, we have uh, UAVs, all of these different types of data inputs are coming in. Well, if I'm wanting to look at an area, say, you know, the Gulf of Mexico at any given time, I would like to pull all the data that has that light, lat latitude and longitude bring it forth and see what all information I can use and then run models against that data. But currently, it's really kind of hard to get that information without actually pulling the data all the way back. But being able to access the metadata, I think, would be, it would be a lot quicker. Ability to create transportable archives. Archiving data and taking that with you, it, it's difficult. And you know, we haven't really come up with a good way of doing that yet, except for, you know, using the, ne the network and, and bringing that out. So an admin. Um, admins would love to see real-time I.O. characteristics. So if a system is getting, you know, just blown away by a certain user, they can pinpoint those I.O. characteristics and what, those user, what data that user is working on and see if we can move them somewhere else that has less of a load on it. Um, easily queried sensitivity levels. That could be classification, that could be um, areas of work. Um, encryption capabilities, yes, we want data at rest encryption. We want data in flight encryption. We want to be able to encrypt data per object. User-defined encryption, if a user wants to you know, encrypt their data, we would like them to be able to do so. Also, group-defined, so if a user leaves, the group can still decrypt that data and we don't lose it. <clears throat> Admin needs to see chain of custody. So who all has access to this data at what given time? Um, being able to look at user project and organizational reporting. Data collection and movement for user project and organization. I just want to see for this project or for this group, how are they moving their data across our ecosystem? Okay. Um, the data curation for a lifetime of a project. If I have a project that's going on for 10 years, I want to be able to have all of that data, bring it back and say, okay, when the project started here, and you could actually see the life of your data and how it moved through your systems. Heat maps of metadata operations, efficient means to purge data. Currently going through billions of files and figuring out which ones you want to delete or not is very time consuming. It's hard to keep up. Um, and then the ability to prov provide quality of service on the IOS subsystems. So the other thing that is really hard to do is whenever you're trying to price out and make requirements for buying new data, we just kind of make a guess on what we have currently and are our users complaining about it. So are, they, are we giving them the throughput we need? Are we giving them the IOPS we need? But if we had detailed reporting to see how the users are utilizing our IO subsystem, and a lot of that, like I said, with metadata, if we can look at it and say, this metadata, types of data, has this capacity required to it. This metadata, when used, was getting this amount of throughput. And then we kind of take and look, these projects are coming down the pipe. Then we can actually say, OK, well, 200 gigabytes per second last year was good. We see that we have ramp ups in these areas of science. We're going to need 500 gigabytes per second throughput in order to meet those requirements. The amount of time a file or object spends on any, any media type, we know data is moving. So at some point, it might be on a solid state drive, but it may only live there for six days. 
And then they're done using that really fast storage, and then they have, but they don't want to get rid of it, so they move it off to you know, an HDD level. And then after they do, they do all their um, calibrations, validations, and they've written their papers, they say, well, okay, I'm done with this. I'm going to send it off to tape. And then how long it, does it stay on tape? And the answer to that question is forever. So we don't really delete any of our data. So um, heat maps of IO traffic and utilization across the enterprise. If we knew how the data was moving across our entire enterprise, we could see where the bottlenecks are and where we can make acquisitions to make that work better and faster. So that was it. I know I talked fast, but I was really nervous. <laughs> so if you have any questions. <laughs> OK. Uh. So you say that you don't ever delete any data. Um, do you want to? I mean, you would if you had the power and confidence and knowledge about what it was and where it was and whether they were using it anymore, you would, you would certainly purge See, it? So the admin in me and the one who wants to save money would say yes. But however, knowing how things work, um, about 13 years ago, there was a division within the Naval Oceanographic Office called Gravity. And what they did was they basically charted the gravitational effects across the ocean. And all that data was kept for over 20 years. Well, so in 2007, they disbanded that entire group. That data is archived off somewhere. But who's to say, you know, in 15 years from right. now, new science isn't going to come along that needs that data? And to be able to go back and actually pull that data and have the metadata be able to say, oh, there it is, that's why we, you know, we don't delete data, because we just don't know what could happen in the future that, where we could actually use that information. Thanks. <clears throat> A question about big data, big in the classical sense of a lot of it. If you have to move or store you know, many petabytes or more uh, in, a, in a place, um, uh, do, you, uh, do you ever federate that or do you always keep it in one place? And second question is, how would you move it? We know the answer is right now, you put it on a drive and you ship it somewhere. But what are your, uh, your future ideas about how that might work out? <clears throat> So, like I said, right now, each DSRC currently has uh, an HSM where they can archive their data for long-term storage. Um, it's a good question about where do we keep it and where do we store it. Um, I think we're still working through that on how to do that, but consolidating down to one or two sites so you have replication is probably one of the most logical ways of going about it, but, you know, we haven't really figured that out yet. We just know we have a lot of it and where it's at now. So we're trying to figure that out. I know I didn't answer your question. I was slimy there. Sorry. Uh, next question. I'm from Salt Lake City, and I've actually been up in the granite vaults mm -hmm. in the mountains. I don't, have you ever been there or visited there? I have there? not been there, but I have heard about them, yes. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions that came up, and this is what I'm thinking, it's great that the data is never lost. But the, one of the difficulties is how long can you keep technology to actually access it? I know in those vaults, they can go back, I think it's 350 years, and they have mag tape readers that they preserve so that you can actually pull that. <laughs> so so currently, you, as the program is, uh, we, have, we have not left data behind. We have brought it forward to current technology. So we don't have old reels of data sitting there that we're trying to make sure we keep. We try to continue to move that forward. Um, as more sensors are out there, I think I read something where they said in, by 2020, each person will create, I think it was something like 20 megabytes of data per second. So with that type of data coming in, we may not be able to keep everything or be able to move everything forward. But currently, we've kept up with it. Thank you. I would just think that'd be fun to have the technology know-how, right, to run that stuff. Right. One of the um, 
requirements you mentioned on the previous slide was about heat maps of metadata utilization um, during, uh, during processing. Can you say a little bit more about what that would be used for and why that's of interest? So that's, I'm a storage geek. So seeing anything about what people are using the data and how they're using the IO subsystem is exciting to me. So being able to see a heat map of the operations during processing, if I know I have a whole lot of reads or a whole lot of writes or, or how that interaction is going, then I can look or how the metadata is being accessed. If I have a system that is being overloaded in the metadata area and I, see, and I can pinpoint it to four users and say those four users are all doing the same type of research, I can then take those users and divide them across my program to where they're not overloading that single resource so the program as a whole is getting what we paid for and not sitting there in an IO wait because of that overload. <clears throat> How does cloud storage fit into your future plans? <laughs> well, I mean, with us being the DOD, I, I guess I get a little nervous about cloud storage, mm -hmm. especially whenever you see uh, headlines about you know, S3 buckets being found with classified data there. Um, so for me, I, that makes me nervous. I don't think it's a completely off-the-shelf idea. I think it's very good in certain aspects of what we could do. Um, but, you know, cloud storage, it's not completely off of what we're already doing. I mean, to me, the cloud is just someone else's data center that I'm pushing out and trusting them to do. So I can see cloud storage being utilized here. Um, but, like I said, those decisions are higher than me and would, you know, I don't have a I wouldn't have a say as far as that being the way forward, but I think if, like Henry was saying, the security is flushed out and, and we have that reliability in, I guess, you know, being told, yes, this is going to be safe and no one else is going to touch your data, then I can see that being a way of utilizing it. Yeah, um, and you can trust yourself to an extent, but whenever you put it in someone else's hands, it gets a little risky. <laughs> 